it's, it's really great to see everybody here um, for the event tonight. And I'd really like to welcome, in particular, Vivek Chibber uh, from coming in from New York uh, to speak with us today. Uh, Vivek is uh, the author of a number of books, including uh, Locked in Place, State Building and Late Industrialization in India. He is the editor of several uh, editions of the Socialist Register. And today he's going to be talking in particular about his book, uh, Post-Colonial Theory, The Spectre of Capital. Uh, this is a book that many of us around here have read, so there may be an uptick in the uh, Amazon sales or whatever in the past little while. Uh, the book, for those of you who haven't read it, is a critique of the attempts of certain types of post-colonial theorists to replace Marxism uh, as the key to understanding global capitalism, to understanding historical sociology, uh, replacing Marxism as sort of a key for understanding the past several hundred years of historical, economic, and political development. And I'm really happy that we've got three members of the sociology department here, too. We have Fanny, Murray Smith, and Janet Conway. Um, and what, what's nice about this, and what I, I'm already satisfied, uh, first of all, I had a very nice dinner with these, uh, the four, Janet couldn't make it, and it was a stimulating discussion. Um, I was mostly observing, as I'm going to do today. But it, was, it was very stimulating. It reminded me of the times where we had time to read and think and make arguments. And I, I would never complain about our position. You know, it's well paid. It's very, very uh, stimulating for the most part. But there's a lot of day-to-day -day stuff that gets us down, forms to fill out, and various bureaucratic exercises. So I really enjoyed you know, that dinner. But I also enjoyed I had a nice chat with Fanny this week and a chat with Murray this week. I haven't had a chance to talk to Janet this week. But it, it reminded me. You know, being a grad student, staying up late and trying to figure out things like you know, Barrington Moore's, uh, I don't remember, from dictatorship to democracy and trying to figure out what it really meant and, and trying to understand the historical events as they, they were pre presented. So, you know, like I said, I'm happy for my colleagues and I'm happy that Vivek has taken the time to come here uh, and speak to us about his book and some of the controversies that it. Uh, Aroused. So um, this is the schedule as you see it behind me. Uh, I'm almost done with my five minutes. Vivek is going to have about 25 minutes, followed by 10 minutes by each of our discussants. Uh, we're going to try to keep to that, even though I'm sure that there's much more that they could say, uh, more than 10 minutes worth. But they will have a chance uh, to speak again uh, during the question and comments portion of the evening. So I'm going to uh, move off the stage, and I'm going to welcome Vivek for the introductory remarks. Thank you. Here or there? Wherever you like. I think I'll stay here. <laughs> There's no more protection. <laughs> Thank you for all, for all for coming on this horribly cold, blizzardy day. Um, it's a little odd, I guess, uh, this format, because um, at my request, uh, Jonah had asked if I would come and give a talk, and I said, I'm, I'm kind of fatigued. I've, I've given literally dozens of lectures now on this book over the past few years, and it's getting to be boring. So I said, what might be more interesting to me is if there could be a conversation around the book, which uh, what Jonah and his colleagues very uh, kindly agreed to arrange. The, the slight difficulty that this puts us in is that um, it's going to end up being a conversation about a book which I imagine many of you have not yet read. And that has a danger of becoming somewhat narrow and technical. And so I will try to keep the issues as broad as possible so that if you have not read the book, you can at least get what is at stake in it and, and what kinds of arguments are being mobilized for uh, or against it. Um, I have been given 25 uh, minutes. I, I hope I don't take the full 25. Um, I don't think an extra five minutes is going to give you that much more information about the book, whereas an extra five minutes of questions would be a lot more illuminating. So I'll try to keep this as short as I can. Um, what, I, what, what this book embodies is a somewhat ambitious intellectual agenda squeezed into a somewhat more narrow um, scholarly agenda. The intellectual agenda 
has to do with assessing and in some ways, uh, I think, uh, confronting a body of work that's become extraordinarily influential over the past 30 years or so. And that body of work is called post-colonial theory. And what is at stake in assessing this work is a fundamental question for anybody engaged in uh, scholarly or political activity, which is the question, is it possible to have one social framework or social theory that is capable of under explaining economic and political development around the world? For a long time, many people belonging to various political and theoretical traditions answered this question in the affirmative. The ar argument was, yeah, it is possible to have one basic theoretical framework which, at different levels of abstraction, is able to apprehend the uh, patterns of development not only of uh, the globe as a whole, but also regions and subregions within it. For Marxists, of course, that framework was Marxist theory. But Marxists were not the only one answering this question in the affirmative. Liberals also did so. They had their own theory. Neoclassical economics, non-Marxist, to be sure, also the answers in the affirmative. It has been a quite a long-standing tradition within the social sciences and within the humanities to think that it's possible to have a general theory of society. On the left, for over 100 years, Marxism was by far the most influential such strand of thinking. It had a theory which it kind of pretentiously called historical materialism, and it had categories and subcategories through which it tried to apprehend not only what happened in Europe, but also how things went down in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. Now, starting around the 1980s, a current of critique emerged in the academy, which gained steam, so that by 90s, the 90s it was actually quite prominent, and I, my, by my estimation, by the early 2000s, it's become the most influential body of critical theory uh, in university life today, and that's called post-colonial theory. Post-colonial theory came out of the turn towards postmodernism and post-structuralism. And it had a very specific uh, set of claims and arguments that it put forward, which was that a denial of the general claim for the possibility of a theory of society as such. At the core of post-colonial theory was an understanding that the frameworks that have come out of the last 100, 150 years, which have claimed for themselves the ability to explain social development east and west, those frameworks are actually uh, catastrophically handicapped by the fact that what they claim to be general propositions about social development actually only apply to a very narrow part of the world, which is Europe and the West. These theories which came out of the West, liberalism, Marxism, these theories are always and inevitably, they said, stamped with the parochialism and the specificity of their origins, which is one very small part of the world. And when they are exported into the rest of the world, they are A, systematically misleading in apprehending or trying to understand what the dynamics of social and political development are in those parts of the world, and that they obscure and occlude what the actual social dynamics are in those parts of the world. But secondly, and most importantly, or equally importantly, these frameworks not only are misleading, but they're misleading in such a way that further uh, embeds these parts of the world into a hierarchy, a global hierarchy in which the countries of the global south remain subordinated to the west. In other words, put it in much more pithily, these western theories, when applied to the global south, end up becoming a reinforcing imperialism. So they are part of the imperial project. And quite explicitly, people like uh, in subaltern studies or out, uh, elsewhere have said, Marx himself and Marxism has, is part of the imperial colonizing project of Europe. Now, this is an extraordinarily powerful set of claims to make. Not only the idea that you, need, you cannot have theories emanating from one part of the world which are applicable everywhere else. Not only that Marxism per se is uh, no less guilty of this than other Western theories, but then also the tremendous normative and political implications when you say that these theories actually aid and abet Western domination. They're not simply misleading, but they're actually reinforcing power structures. So when I was like you when I was in grad school and this stuff was becoming popular, my reaction was bullshit. Uh, and I kept waiting for somebody to criticize this stuff, somebody to critique it, and uh, it wouldn't happen. 
So around the early 2000s, I came to the realization that it wasn't going to happen uh, for a variety of reasons having to do with how academia works. Uh, so I somewhat reluctantly took up the task of uh, trying to write a systematic critique of this body of work, which I thought was, uh, while entirely uh, justified in making the claims per se that it was making, couldn't really cash them out. The arguments didn't make any sense. Uh, so uh, I figured that somebody needs to criticize it. Um, the question was, how do you criticize it? And I want to say something about that because it's come up in, in reactions to the book. Postcolonial theory is not an easy set of ideas to pin down. A lot of it is just, uh, it's not so much a theory as a style. Uh, it has to do with the words you use, the way in which you craft your sentences, the way you position yourself in the fashion hierarchy of academia. Uh, and when you try to pin down as to what the actual claims of the theory are, they, they become somewhat elusive. They're especially elusive because the way academia works, um, oftentimes people try to make their work uh, more publishable by citing well-known and respected authors because that makes it seem immediately like you're following an established stream of research rather than blazing a path of your own, which nobody likes to do. So, as a consequence, arguments that are not, in my view, actually abiding by the core claims of postcolonial theories, uh, if such as they are, we can find them, those arguments are easily palmed off as postcolonial theory simply by virtue of the way in which citations are strategically and tactically, tactically used. Secondly, it's, it's not easy to pin down because the theorists themselves often abjure uh, any claims to doing theory. But as you all know, uh, if you thought about this, you really can't do any social inquiry without an explicit or implicit theoretical commitment. Every research project is abiding by some general and broad propositions about how things work, what the causal structure of the world is, etc., etc. So even though the, uh, the disclaimers about theory are uh, ever present in post-colonialism, one can still look into the work and see, well, what are the underlying presumptions which they either are not aware of or uh, refuse to admit to. Nevertheless, the challenge still remains. How do we come to the core propositions of a theory if we're going to actually address it? Because you run the danger if you cannot justifiably come to the core propositions of your interlocutor saying, well, that's not what I said, or, well, you're just picking on that dude, these other people over here are saying other things, and you're calling him post-colonial or her post-colonial, but so are they, and yada, yada. All right, so um, the challenge was to then come up with some unimpeachably post-colonial uh, authors, and who are uh, influential. So they're not some marginal figures who happen to be toiling away somewhere, but have real influence in defining the field. And uh, thirdly, are advancing the body of theory that's internally coherent, consistent with each other, and has uh, some kind of um, verifiable content to it. Uh, furthermore, as, as a last constraint, they have to be doing some work that was empirical. Because again, the, the key is, we're trying to understand, can post-colonial theory really cash out its arguments that uh, traditional European theories fail, you can only cash it out if you show empirically that these theories are wrong. And can it cash out its argument that it is able to illuminate the reality of the Global South better than these uh, European theories, which again requires some kind of empirical branding. This is why I settled on this uh, group of anthropologists, historians, sociologists known as subaltern studies. Um, while subaltern studies does not exhaust the field of post-colonialism, there are many other very prominent post-colonial theorists who are not in subaltern studies. Nevertheless, it does, uh, I think, unimpeachably constitute a core component of what post-colonial studies is, and the proof of that is virtually every anthology, I actually went out and checked this, virtually every anthology of post-colonial theory, post-colonial studies, either has a chapter on subaltern studies, or it has writings from the subalternists as an example of what the field is. It is extremely influential in the way that its key categories have carried over into anthropology, history, and sociology. Indeed, uh, regional subaltern studies projects were actually started up under its influence. There's a Latin American subaltern studies that actually had its own journal, and even in Africa, there's been a new emergence of kind of subalternist crew, as it were, uh, for African history. So it seems to me that um, it's very hard to deny that this group is very influential. They certainly do empirical work, and I would say they're the only wing of post-colonial theory that's actually striven 
for uh, consistency and internal coherence. It's, it's a real kind of, uh, I think it goes in its, it's to its credit that one can say that. Uh, so I settled on this group for these reasons, not because I thought it was exhaustive of the field, but I thought it, it is representative of the field. Uh, and th that's a, what I believed then, and I, I believe it no less now. All right, so if we just take these group, this group of intellectuals as being emblematic, a representative of what the field is, then how, what are their core claims, and how do they cash out the larger claim uh, of both the ina inadequacy of Western theories and the superiority of their own? Well, there are three basic uh, ideas coming out of this, this body of work, which I'm just going to mention, and, I'll, and also mention where and how I think they're wrong. Of course, I can only assert these things in a very short talk. I can't demonstrate them in any, any way. I, I imagine that in the questions and answers, we'll get uh, to them in more detail. The fundamental claim coming out of this group, this stream of scholarship, is that Western theory, specifically Marxism, but beyond Marxism, is not fully capable of analyzing or understanding the nature of political and social dynamics in the non-West. By the non-West, they of course, they concentrate on India, but their claims quite clearly extend beyond it. First of all, so that the argument goes, theories emanating out of the West are incapable of understanding these. The second claim is the reason they're incapable of understanding the East is because the social and institutional development of the East has unfolded in a way that A, cannot be captured by the categories coming out of Marxism, and B, which have generated forms of consciousness, cultural orientations, and strategic uh, orientations, which are fundamentally different than what is presumed of political actors by Western theory. That sentence is too long, I can repeat it. Too long? No. That the, the political, the, uh, the unfolding of uh, institutions and culture in the non-West non has been of a character that has generated forms of consciousness, political cultures, and strategic orientations very different from what Western theory assumes about it. So Western theory assumes Look, whenever, whenever you analyze politics, you're going to, people are going to be interest-driven, they're going to be individualistic, or they're going to be blah, blah, blah. But look, these guys say Indians don't think that. So how can your theory ever make sense of why Indians are doing what they're doing when their fundamental orientation towards the world runs against the assumptions of Western theory? It goes on. So that's claim number two. Claim number three, three is what we call meta-theory. That there's a set of uh, arguments in, in these works and also in post-colonial theory more generally about how to do theory. And at the heart of this is one particular one that I take up, which is any time you have a theory that is abstract and general, it's going to homogenize real differences. And any time it homogenizes real differences, it becomes incapable of understanding real specificity. So then this is something I take up as well. These are three core claims. Uh, the first one about evolution, the second one about consciousness, the third one about how to do theory, meta theory. What I try to do in my book is to show that every single one of these is wrong. Not only wrong, but spectacularly wrong. Not only spectacularly wrong, but the evidence for this is found in the, the works of the subaltern theorists themselves. That is, their own work on Indian history shows that their arguments about the essential and abiding difference between India and the West cannot be sustained. So first of all, this argument about uh, the unfolding of institutions being fundamentally different. Okay, that, that could be true. And we know that there's lots of differences between East and West. We know that there's lots of cultural differences. We know there's lots of social and political differences. That is not what's being said. What's being said here is that the capitalism in the East, even though it's capitalism, and should be therefore analyzable through the normal categories of economics or political science or sociology, that capitalism is so different from the capitalism of the West that even though you can use the word to keep referring to it, its causal properties have no semblance with the way in which capitalism in the West operates. So when you take a category like capitalism to, say, Egypt or India, you expect workers to be doing certain things. You expect their capitalists to be behaving in certain ways because that's what capitalism is. 
But in the Indian or Egyptian capitalism, that's not what's going on. It's very, very different. And really, you may justifiably say the word itself needs to be ditched. We need a different word for understanding the economic and dynamics of Egypt or Israel. And what's core to this difference is the class of capitalists in the East simply did not carry out the same kinds of historical transformations that the capitalists in the West did. And because they didn't carry out the same kinds of transformations, the social and institutional evolution of these countries ended up being way different. What was this basic difference? In the West, capitalists overthrew feudalism, implanted democracy. Through democracy, implanted a secular culture. Through that secular culture, brought notions, modern notions of individuality, individual interests, individual politics, of the contract, of rule of law, of liberalism. They brought all that into their countries. But when capitalists went to the East, they didn't do any of this. They instead preferred to put into place dictatorial, authoritarian political structures. And the result of that was none of the transformations that occurred in the West were brought about in the East. You didn't get liberalism. You didn't get democracy. You didn't get any of these things. So, Capitalism goes into two parts of the world. In one part, it does one set of things. In one part, it does something completely different. And the result is, in the East, the kinds of institutions that you have cannot be captured by categories like capitalism. You get this? So empirically, what I try to show is that this is fundamentally wrong. Not because they get the story of the East wrong. It's because they get this, they're working with an incredibly rarefied and uh, highly mythologized notion of what capitalism in the West is. All those awful things that they say capitalists in the East are doing is exactly what they did in the West. So the nature of capital was no different in the two parts of the world. So the claims for an essential and abiding difference between the two falls apart. Secondly, about consciousness. The, the fundamental consciousness of the East. What's different about it? Westerners uh, uh, are, have a conception of the, the self that's individual. They fight for their individual interests. They pursue their material uh, uh, strategic objectives. Whereas in the East, people are, don't have a bounded conception of the self. They're other-oriented. They're driven by a sense of obligation. And in fact, they don't even recognize it when they're being exploited. Because the person exploiting them is part of the same caste as them, or belongs to the same village as them. And the notion of community overwhelm the possibility of apprehending the individual exploitation that's going on. Well, that's a heady claim. In addition, there's come others. Notion, uh, the capacity for reason is Western. Eastern people think through intuition. The capacity for objectivity is Western. Eastern people think through how their obligations are going to affect their, uh, their external perception, etc. Et All these things. So what I try to show in the book then is that <laughs> happily absurd, and their own work shows that it's absurd. Uh, in the peasant histories, the worker histories that they show, that they uh, have, have um, uh, produced, their own work shows that Indian peasants were very aware of their own exploitation, Indian workers were very aware of it, they fought for their individual interests, etc., etc., etc. The third, this meta-theoretical claim, that any attempt to generalize means you're obscuring differences, uh, has two responses. One is, well, of course, that's what abstraction is. You abstract in order to ignore them. That's what theory is. Theory is saying, across many cases, certain things are held in common. That's theory. If you don't want to do that, don't do theory. We'll just do individual, uh, infinite individual biographies of people. But there's a more important point, which is that theories, when carried out uh, with some degree of skill, don't simply obscure differences. They, th they show how those differences exist against the backdrop of common structural forces. And any theory that cannot do that is not just going to end up being an infinite agglomeration of individual case studies. It's going to be a theory that systematically obscures common structural forces where they do in fact exist. And if it is true that something like capitalism is spread across the world, if it is true that human beings do have certain basic needs, basic drives that they hold in common across cultures, Ignoring these real commonalities in the name of difference does not give you a social theory that's going to illuminate very much. So these are the three arguments I, I try to make uh, put forward. Out of that comes a kind of a mega or conclusion, which is I think, but also touched off some of the controversy around the book, which is I said 
These arguments coming out of post-colonial theory are not just wrong, but they are, in fact, the polite word is Orientalist, the real word is racist. When you say that brown people and black people fundamentally have different needs than white people, and indeed when you say that the difference is that white people are rational, scientific, guided by reason, and these little wogs over here are motivated by religion, community, mutual obligation, etc., etc. We've heard this before. That is what the British were saying as they were rampaging across Africa and India and destroying the communities that they were supposedly civilizing. When objections came up out of liberalism in England that what you're doing to these populations, these cultures is wrong, you're denying them certain basic goods and basic privileges that we have been forced to give to our own populations. The response was, you're assigning to these people needs, desires, values that do, they do not in fact have. They don't think like us. Now, up until the 1980s, this was considered a racist way of thinking. It is one of the many signs of intellectual and moral degeneration since the 80s in the academy that these tropes can be palmed off as radical or progressive. So what I tried to say, not in such brazen language in the book, was something like this. That these are not just wrong, uh, these ideas, uh, but they're in fact uh, um, abiding by the same colonial values and colonial descriptions of people that post-colonial theory is ostensibly trying to overturn. It is a theory, therefore, that un under the guise and in the name of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, ends up resurrecting the intellectual and analytical framework that colonialism itself produced in order to justify its domination of the non-West. So whatever the flaws, therefore, and there are many, of these so-called European theories like Marxism or like liberalism, whatever their flaws, they have one very uh, important core element that needs to be, I think, upheld, which is that Underneath all of our differences, underneath the cultural variations which are real, there is a common humanity that binds all of us together. Regardless of our skin, regardless of our geographical location. To uphold this common humanity is not to deny real cultural differences, but it is to affirm the possibility of a future in which we treat each other with mutual respect, and in, we, in which we move together towards a more equitable and a more humane social order. You get rid of that notion of underlying commonalities, and all you have is endless tribes warring against each other. That's the future, I hope, in the age of Trump, that we can reach out. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you got the ball rolling there. Um, in my excitement to, to see so many people here and get started, I forgot to make this one important announcement, that is, uh, thanks to the Department of Sociology for you know, bringing me here, as well as Department of History and the Social Justice Research Institute, and of course the Brock Socialist Club. Many of you are here, uh, and, and many of you are welcome to come to our further events, also organize this event. So, with that introduction, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Sociology, Jack Cotton. Hi everybody, um, I'm astonished to see so many people out on a, the first Friday night in spring, that is so lovely out. Anyway, it's great that you're here and I appreciate the invitation and uh, welcome to Vivek, to, to Brock and to St. Catharines. Um, so I spent the week reading Vivek's book um, and um, what I'm going to do tonight, I think similar to, to what he said, is that uh, I'm not going to engage in a detailed interaction with him about um, his critique of subaltern studies, which you've gotten, you know, the outlines of that. Uh, and as I'm sure you picked up, it's you know it's a detailed uh, critique based on these three central authors. It's a very polemical critique, um, and um, rather than get into the sort of technicalities of that, I thought it would be more instructive for all of us like he has also chosen to do 
to think about uh, the broad parameters of the field uh, that we're calling uh, post-colonial studies. So in the 10 minutes that I have, I want to make basically five points and ask a few questions or to pose them to Vivek for his consideration. So the first point is that, um, uh, and Vivek is well aware of this, of course, but I think it's a really important point, and that is that um, there is a plurality of uh, post-colonial studies, right? That there is quite a range of uh, scholarship and politics that go under the labels of anti-colonial, post-colonial, decolonial, indigenous, black, uh, anti-racist theory, politics that are broad, can be broadly considered uh, post-colonial uh, forms of thought and politics. Subaltern studies is one school. It's also a school that, uh, and, the, and the works that he is paying attention to especially, was produced in the 1980s. That's quite a while ago. Um, so it was at the height of uh, postmodernism, of the debates about postmodernism, and of the decentering of Marxism in its kind of uniquely privileged role as um, the kind of master discourse of critical theory and politics. Um, so the first major point to say is that there's a plurality of postcolonial theory and politics, and subaltern studies is just one uh, school. Um, other important schools um, that I'm certainly informed by would be postcolonial feminism, which uh, exploded in the 1990s and continues to be a very capacious body of work. The Latin American modernity, coloniality, decolonial school, uh, indigenous social and political thought in North America, uh, settler colonial studies in the white settler colonies around the world, critical race studies, uh, anti-racist and decolonial feminism. All of these, I would say, are part of a, a big, diverse body of post-colonial scholarship that's not all saying the same thing. And this I completely agree with Vivek. There's not a single theory here, nor are these scholars seeking to produce one. Now, uh, pointing to the plurality of post-colonial scholarship, I want to say that I'm not in Robert Young's school uh, that you, I think, I'm sure you're going to teach Robert Young, uh, in the sense that I'm not asserting a single lineage. I don't think there's a single lineage in the scholarship that kind of goes from Marxism you know, into sort of something called post-colonial theory. Uh, it's not all one big happy family. It's not all internally uh, coherent. So there's not a single theory. They're not, uh, most are not seeking to produce a general theory. It's eclectic, it's interdisciplinary, and most importantly, from our purposes here tonight, it's in motion. It's not something that I think can be fixed in these particular scholars that you've written and spoke about. It's as important as they are, and absolutely they're important, but I think that um, as a field, it's in motion. And it's exceedingly internally diverse. Okay, secondly, um, what I want to say tonight here is that uh, without, I wouldn't park myself in any one of these schools. I personally draw eclectically across these schools, so I'm not advocating swallowing any one work or school of thought or theorist whole. But having said that, I do think that there are elements across this diverse body of scholarship that I would consider indispensable to critical theory and politics in the world today. So just to start with would be uh, the awareness that I think post-colonial scholarship has, um, has really uh, highlighted that the making of the modern world has been a 500-year project. And so to engage and understand the world that we are living in requires a 500-year horizon. Secondly, that we can't think the global without the colonial. That we can't think about global inequality without the colonial. We cannot reduce colonialism to capitalism. Capitalism and colonialism are deeply, inextricably interrelated, and they have been from their moment of origin, and that continues into the present. So I don't think that talking about capitalism um, is adequate. Nor do I think we can talk about colonialism without talking about capitalism. 
So following the majority coloniality decolonial school in Latin America, I would say that we have to date the onset of modernity and capitalism in their interrelatedness to the conquest of the Americas. We have to date it to 1492. So we date modernity not with the Enlightenment in Europe, but with the conquest. And these scholars would argue, and I think this is a really, to me, indispensable insight, that coloniality is constitutive of modernity. There's no modernity without coloniality. There's no capitalist modernity without coloniality. They're both <coughs> born together and born capitalist. And that global coloniality is a present condition. It's not something that ended with formal decolonization. It's a present condition. So with this bundle of insight comes another really important insight. And that is that neither capitalism nor modernity can be thought of as intra-European developments. They did not originate in Europe and diffuse to the rest of the world. Their origin is in the conquest. It's in the entanglement between <coughs> Europe and its imperial adventures. And it cannot be thought apart from that. Uh, and that's a really, really critical insight, I think, that runs across and through um, post-anti and decolonial studies. So capitalism and modernity are produced in trans-regional entanglements. And this is where I think I would agree that um, your uh, representation of the subaltern uh, studies school in drawing a hard line, or too hard a line, between the European West and India, the East, uh, is, that's, that's a good, credible critique. However, there are many, many post-colonial scholars, especially in the present, talking about the importance of thinking about trans-regional entanglements, about transnational methodologies, about getting past thinking about regions as if they are self-contained. And that if you think that these things, modernity, capitalism, coloniality, are born together and they're born in the encounter that we can't think of these regions as separate regions. Nor can we think about, uh, and, and this is a question perhaps for Vivek, is that um, one of the key insights I think of the scholarship and key critiques is of methodological nationalism, is the notion that capitalism can be thought of or studied on national terms. They would claim again across this field of study, that it's a global phenomenon. It's a, it was born global, and it has, to be, it has to be studied in that way. However, saying that capitalism and modernity are born together, and they're born through trans-regional entanglements, doesn't mean that it's globally the same, or even. It looks, feels, is lived, and is thought differently in the metropole and in the colonies, by elites and by subalterns. And that unevenness is what the Latin Americans call the coloniality of power. So we can't understand the global matrix of colonial modernity, coloniality, capitalism without thinking about the coloniality of power, that this arrangement is enacted through violence through the violence of European imperialism. So that bundle of insight also becomes the ground and for another kind of critical argument that I think runs across this, this scholarship. And that is that um, the rejection of a stage theory of history, and I guess this is also a question to Vivek, is to what extent there's a stage theory of history that still underpins your work. And I think that there's a critique of that that runs across post-colonial scholarship because there is a rejection of the notion that capitalism, something called capitalism originates in Europe, gets worked out in Europe, and then diffuses to the rest of the world. And other places then can be seen to be going through a same stage of development that Europe did. Many of these post-colonial scholars reject that stage theory of history. Another version of that history, very familiar to people in sociology, would be the notion of a, tra a transition from tradition to modernity that underpins the discipline of sociology. 
cross postmillennial scholarship, there's a rejection of that. And Chakrabarti, one of uh, your interlocutors, of course, uh, calls this a rejection of the notion of a waiting room in history. That the, the, the non-West or the South is in the waiting room, waiting to catch up, constantly to catch up to Europe. That dominant understanding of the specialness of Europe, that Europe is ahead, that Europe is setting the pattern, that everybody else is catching up, that this kind of a setup um, for this stage theory of history is what is uh, one of the things that's being um, critiqued and dismantled <coughs> across post-colonial scholarship in favor of thinking about these developments as entangled and entangled inextricably with Europe's imperial positioning and with Europe's colonial rule. And that, I would say, also goes for developments in Europe that are commonly understood as unique to Europe. The Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, the Enlightenment. How, what would it mean to rethink these developments if we pulled out of the shadows the fact that Europe is in a relationship of colonial violence and rule with most of the rest of the world? What, how do we rethink the French Revolution if you think about the European encounter with the Iroquois Confederacy? and the fact that we know it had that had influence on the formation of the American Constitution. How do we rethink the Europeanness of those kinds of events? Okay, third point. As Vivek has already pointed out, um, one of the uh, kind of key um, thematics or problematics that postcolonial scholarship takes on is the notion that the, that knowledge uh, is central to the coloniality of power. That the uh, ascendance of European knowledge and the assertion of the superiority of European knowledge has been central to Western domination. And this is a really key uh, set of claims that of course is very central to Vivek's uh, project to try to dismantle that. Um, and again, drawing on the Latin Americans here, um, what they, they have proposed, uh, I think, a very important concept that I draw on regularly, and that is of colonial difference. And what they say is that colonial difference is that which has been rendered different through um, the superiority of Western knowledge claims. Western claims to rationality have rendered colonial others other, have rendered them backward, have rendered them destined to disappear. And that has created colonial difference and has uh, enshrined colonial difference. Now what's really important in terms of the Latin American scholarship is that colonial difference is not just that which is subalternized or um, um, impoverished. Colonial difference is also grounds for an alternative way of life. In other words, there, there's positive content in colonial difference. And that's a really, really important contribution uh, coming from the Latin American scholars. And I guess a question to Vivek coming from this is that um, and he does certainly recognize difference and the um, persistence of difference. But I guess my question to Vivek is, what difference does that difference make? The Latin Americans are saying that difference makes a lot of difference. That colonial difference can become the basis for ways of living and being and thinking otherwise. The grounds for critique of modernity coloniality. But Vivek is very, very committed to the notion of universal knowledge and of recuperating the status of Western theory, particularly Marxism, to produce a universal kind of theory. And I guess my question here would be, what then is the status 
of non-Western knowledge, and, and especially subaltern knowledge, which is not the same thing, right? So non-Western knowledge is being other civilizational knowledges, but then, then there's also subalternized knowledge. Fourth, um, one of central, uh, one of the central uh, preoccupations uh, is the question of agency, and he makes an argument about he wants to defend the notion of uh, kind of universal common humanity uh, that's capable of, of a similar, I guess, similar kind of agency. Um, and and that's you know as far as it goes, I think fine. But what again, what um, I see the subaltern studies scholars trying to say, and, and many others across these fields of postcolonial studies demonstrating is that colonial difference is at the exteriority of modernity. It's not outside of it. It's, there's not an absolute divide. It's partially connected, but it's enough exterior, exteriorized by relations of power that it can become the basis for, an, for alternative ways of thinking and being. Now there's lots of examples, I think, Anybody here who's in touch at all with indigenous resistance in Canada, I think it is one of the most obvious examples in our own context of different um, cosmologies, different ways of thinking and being that have survived, that are incompletely colonized, and that people have a stake in them. They're not just a, a, a source of negativity, they're a, they're a source of positive life and that they are also becoming the grounds of resistance, you know? So when we see resistance to pipelines in Canada or at Standing Rock, this is not just the working class against capitalism. This is indigenous peoples defending rocks and air and animals and all their relations, which is not the same as working class relations. Like there's a different cosmology at work here. Um, so my question here for Vivek is that, uh, again, these alternative agencies, I think, appear when you uh, recognize the ongoing existence of History 2. You know, when you talk about Chakrabarti's History 2. But they seem to be inconsequential. They're there, they remain, but they're not important in terms of looking to the future or looking for grounds of resistance. So I would just be interested to hear what you have to say about that. And then my last point is that um, I think some of the most important recent work in postcolonial studies is being done by feminists. And not only feminists, but um, feminists in particular have been um, very strenuously arguing that from the beginning, capitalist modernity has been a racialized and gendered project. And uh, racialized in the fact that the slave trade was central to it, racialized in how indigenous people were turned into forms of serf labor, uh, racialized in the sense of the creation of social categories with the conquest that did not pre-exist that, and also the imposition of European gender orders. And that these um, racialized and gendered forms of inequality actually precede, historically precede, proletarianization. And that's a very, very thought-provoking claim coming from post-colonial studies in terms of how we think about the relationships of race, class, and gender. Because in a lot of forms of critical theory that are underpinned by Marxism, race and gender are derivative. They're secondary. Come on. Well, come back at me, Ken. Come back at me. Anyway, I, I mean, we'll see what I'm going to say. Uh, this is an, uh, a very important, I think, alternative <coughs> claim. So my question to Vivek here is, where are race and gender in your book? Two chapters. Do they matter? You actually have to read I read the book. I read okay. the whole book. OK, so I'll be really interested to hear this. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jan Janet. I, maybe I gave, we gave the discussions an impossible task of staying 10 minutes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Tibal, thanks a lot for the controversy your book has provoked. 
Um, this is a little difficult stuff for me to know because I have Marxist sympathies but with the post-colonial experience. So I will try to navigate through you know both um, you know of this. Uh, the problem I have with meta narratives like Marxism is that they promote what uh, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda described as a tragedy of a single story. That's one major problem I have with meta narratives. But I also acknowledge very well that in the writing, uh, the author clearly you know, articulated his ideas of uh, post-colonialism, uh, post but focus particularly on the subaltern theory. And we've had other speakers talk about the plurality of the post-colonial experience or post-colonial theory particularly. So I will be talking, giving a talk from a perspective of my understanding of the post-colonial framework from the African experience. And from the African experience, uh, post-colonial theory, what it tries to do is to deconstruct the occidental construction of the Orient. And to that extent, I think you know, it, it has gone far in, in you know, what it set out to do. So I have about six critics, but I will try to focus on four. And <laughs> And my first critique, I, I call the tragedy of Eurocentrism and the defense of the post-colonial theory. And this is a response to your conclusion. Any uh, claim for the value of the post-colonial theory as an analytical framework or as an anti-imperialist critique has failed, more or less. And um, let me uh, start my rebuttal by um, sharing with you the experience of the post-colonial uh, discourse in the African continent. Um, for many of you today, you, you know the typical portrayal, the picture of the black man as primitive. The basis of racism in modern times was, you know, that foundation was laid by Eurocentric scholarship by knowledge producers from the colonial Europe. And in the African continent, that was what uh, the post-colonial set out to challenge. I remember when I was in high school, we used to read, we were first because it was in the school curriculum, to read the book called The Primitive Man. And it was about us, okay? Written by Europeans. And this, kind of depiction was promoted particularly by social anthropologists, colonial anthropologists, who were supplying the knowledge base for the control and the expro expropriation of the resources of Africa. And um, what basically they were doing was to present Africans as non-human and very primitive, thereby justifying the policy of exploitation that was being torn up by colonial administrators. I'll give you an example. Both Malinowski in Polynesia, Ben Lewis Strasser in Africa, or people like Stanley Dyer. If you know anything about anthropology in the 1960s, anthropology was struggling to be recognized by other social sciences as a science. And one way of doing this was to appropriate the knowledge. It was a Western appropriation of the knowledge of Africa. So that if an African scholar discussed you know, anything about his life, that scholarship will be uh, described as subjective. That the scholar was subjective. As um, Stanley uh, Diamond described it, anthropological endeavor involved a process which legitimizes only the Western portrait of the native life. So if the scholarship comes from a Western scholar, European scholar, that is objective. 
if you came from Africa, definitely you are. But I ask them for over the years, this depiction of the black person as a primitive human being and stuff like that, Christianized. And as a matter of fact, you wonder why the post colonials had to push back. Okay? Despite my sympathies for Marx, why Marx was concerned about the debilitating condition of the working people in Europe. Okay? You had a sizable percentage of mankind who were regarded as properties. It wasn't a major focus of Marx's discourse. And this kind of prompted the type of post-colonial pushback uh, you got uh, from the African continent. I'll give you one example. A book published in 1902 by a Polish-British scholar um, or writer, Joseph Comrade, was called The Heart of the Darkness. You still have copies of the book floating around. If you read the work and the depiction of the African in the work, you could understand why it became necessary for the earliest post-colonial writers in literature, by the way, before social sciences started to appropriate. People like Chinua Achebe in Nigeria, he came out in 1958 with a wonderful book that has sold more than 25 million copies called The Things Fall Apart. If you haven't read it, you need to. And uh, another a Kenyan writer, Gubi Watiyan, these are people who started to push back at that stage. And the implication, the damage done by Eurocentric scholarship in the continent is enormous. In Nigeria, for instance, they are still teaching kids that a Scottish explorer, Mon uh, Mongo Park, discovered the source of the Niger in Nigeria, a river in the Niger. Meanwhile, the same storyline said that halfway he got lost, and the locals had to show him the way to escape. Meanwhile, he discovered the source of the Niger, but he discovered it for Europeans. But this is the type of scholarship you get in the continent. Um, I'll move to another uh, area of my concern about your book. Very well written. But the tendency to present Marxism as a homogeneous school of thought, I find that very troubling. Because people like Louis L. Toussaint gave ideology and an autonomous status, not subject to the influence of the economy. And if we follow uh, Granchi's analysis of cultural ideology, uh, you know, the manipulation of culture as a way to mobilize and control the population and create the enabling environment for capitalism, you could also see the influence of ideology as they step into some of these um, uh, colonies. And uh, why, you know, the need for, for people to sometimes um, uh, push back. And I think. It is also a little problematic for me to accept your use of capitalism as a homogeneous system. Because historically, and up to now, you, you see that even though we threw around capitalism and stuff, the structure of capitalism differed. An increasing number of scholars, people like Jeremy Peck, Adam Tickle, people like Kim Bach, have explained that capitalism appears in variegated form as capitalism as it moves into countries, it, it, muta it mutates. And these mutations automatically changes the structure. I'll give you two examples or three examples. The capitalist structure in Germany that was more or less um, advanced to the other liberal scholarship or the capitalist, the structure of the capitalism there that you call social market economy is quite different from neoliberalism in the United States. Quite different in structure. And it's not a recent development. Germany, since the time of Bismarck in the 19th century, has had a very strong social welfare policy. Since the time of Bismarck, no reform, no economic change has altered that in any form or shape. And social welfare economy is dependent. Actually, Otoli Brasso push that, okay? They also push for a very robust state intervention in the economy as a stabilizing force for economic competition, okay? So you have a promotion of state intervention as a basic constituent of the capitalist system. 
Uh, but we also have a social welfare system as a pillar of support of the German capitalist system for at least since 1873, I think, when Bismarck was still in power. If you compare that to the neoliberal economy in the United States, our United Kingdom that since the time of at least Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan has promoted um, limited government and individual responsibility, they are not the same system. Or how do you describe the state abandoned economic policy in China or Vietnam or the type that Cuba is experimenting with? Why do I address this? Because in your book you argue that irrespective of the structure of capitalism, that economic production everywhere follows the same common set of rules as capitalism expands. And I don't think that is completely correct in my understanding of the structure of capitalism in these uh, areas. The fourth point, which I, I already hinted you this afternoon, was your use of the concept of laboring group to represent all the working class people across the globe. I, I kind of felt when I was reading it that this was an experiment in sophistry, you know, because, I mean, writing from a classical Marxist perspective that you could have been, uh, you could have pursued the argument of the proletariat, which is working class, individuals who end their living within the social architecture of wage level. In many parts of the developing world, the, a substantial percentage of the population do not fall into this. You have peasant farmers who are independent entrepreneurs, not in any form of exploitative relationship with anybody. You have people who work in the guild system, and these guilds have survived generations. They just were born into it, they learn how to do that. I will give you the example of the recent attempts, you know, by, of course, uh, the Washington institutions to push across the WTO trips agreement all over, forcing countries to change their legislations to protect intellectual property rights. The way it affects this category of workers in the global south is quite different than the way, okay, than the way um, it affects the rest of us, okay? In, in Africa, for instance, the, for the fight against the uh, attempt by Monsanto group to modify and own uh, complete copyright over the overseas. Had, uh, I was saying that I saw that as a, a conflict, as a clash between global capital and the localized support and capital, rather than as that between global capital and some category of the laboring group who will lose. I, I, I think, is my time up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fanny. Yeah. The, the third discussion is Mary Smith. Oh dear. <laughs> so many issues, so little time. Um, I'm going to try to keep to uh, 10 minutes. I actually prepared a text. It takes the form of almost uh, a set of theses. Um, and uh, my original idea was simply to read them, but I do have to say a few things uh, before I get into this because. The discussion has gone in some uh, unexpected directions. Um, and I kind of thought that might happen. I think I even told Josh over here yesterday that uh, it was quite possible that I would ditch my <laughs> uh, I got excited enough about what he said. But I, I want to affirm some agreements with both Janet and Fanny, but even though I have major disagreements, honestly, with both of you. And I'm far closer to, to Vivek. But I want to say a few things about where I agree. You know, Janet, you said so many things that were absolutely right on. You know, about the interconnection between capitalism and colonialism. Uh, you know, you raised our hair, as, as a fact you did as well, about the, the violence right, that uh, attended the emergence what we call the modern world since 1492. All of that is true. All of that was registered by 
the moor, right? You should Volume explain who that is. Pardon me? You should explain who that is. That is the moor. Everybody knows who the moor is? No. Karl Marx. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would actually say who. So you can spread the code for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't for you. So, you know, read the, you know, Marx's famous cap uh, chapter in Volume 1 of Capital about uh, the primitive accumulation. You know, it is hair raising. Have you read it? I don't know. Uh, a lot of people haven't. So, a lot of these criticisms, seems to me, are kind of odd when they're made against Marx. Marxism is another question. Right? Because as Fanny quite rightly points out, Marxism is not one homogeneous body of thought. It is not a monolith. In fact, I have major disagreements, personally, with much of the so-called orthodox Marxism of the 20th century. You know, the doctrines that uh, were promulgated, especially by the Soviet leadership uh, from the days of Stalin's leadership on. And they have problems also with the Maoist version of that. And I think part of my disagreement with that orthodoxy has always been this commitment to a theory of stages, which you referred to. This is not, you know, endemic in some sense to Marx's own thought. It is not constitutive of Marx's own thought. You can take one little passage from the 1859 preface of the Contribution to Critique of Political Economy, where he talks about uh, progressive epics in the economic formation of society. And you could choose to read that as a theory of stages that is applicable to every social formation, to every country, which is what the Stalinists did, which was what many of the classical social democrats did, too, before them. But you can also read it in a very different way, a way that's consistent with uh, the ideas of Trotsky, for example, his law of uneven combined development, and his theory of the revolution. So there, there, are, there are weaknesses, no doubt, in that orthodox received version of Marxism that the post-colonial critics have been able to seize upon in order to try to discredit Marxism as a whole, Marxism basic project, which is, I want to remind everybody, uh, an integrated uh, project, the unity of theory and practice. And that's why I really want to bring that in my remarks. So with that said, I'll move on to my script. Okay? So my, my interest in, uh, in Divick's book stems really less from my abiding preoccupation with post-colonial theory, which, uh, to be very honest, I haven't really engaged with very much at all. I don't teach contemporary social theory, thank God. <laughs> so I have to get Everybody lucky here know I'm much more interested in uh, political economy. And that seems to find a very strong expression in the way I teach classical social theory as well. Uh, but uh, my interest in the book does stem largely from the fact uh, that it is an engagement with an influential body of theory that has been quite influential in trying to poke holes uh, in Marxist theory, to which, again, I think most of you know I'm pretty attached, my own version of it anyway. And my longtime interest, of course, as an academic and as a political activist, too, has been to try to sustain the theoretical foundations of Marxist revolutionary socialist political project in a very difficult time, I might add. And that project, to my mind, is one that is predicated on a scientific critique of a determinate mode of production called capitalism, which is not just some made up thing, but which is a real phenomenon. It's a real structure, uh, obeying very definite laws of motion, in my opinion. It's also predicated on a profound internationalist vision and an insistence, this is the political part, that the wage earning working class is, like it or not, I wish it weren't the case sometimes, but 
like it or not, the work, wage earning working, sorry, wage earning working class is the only social force with a consistent interest and capacity to end the rule of capital and construct a social society. As the young Marx observed, the proletariat has radical change. The task of revolutionary socialists, that is to say, of communists, genuine communists, must be to help working people in their struggle to transgress the limits of capital and social relations, and also what Professor Chigger calls uh, the logic of capital. Marx's theoretical contributions are in the service of a program of working class, political independence, and workers' power. Encapsulated in the notion, the slogan, if you like, that those who labor must rule. Not with the view to reducing class inequalities, create a more humane form of capitalism. Not with the view to reducing these class inequalities that are so obvious in the and the antagonisms that go with them. But with a view to creating a classless future, a classless future, a project which Marx believed is only achievable on a world scale. Faced with the challenge of confining my remarks uh, to, ten, to 10 minutes, which I think I've already... How much time do I have left? A class between two issues with five, five, five more minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, I may need a little extra time. I'll concentrate on two issues, one that might be called meta-theoretical and the other programmatic. Okay? The first question pertains to whether we can speak of a dialectic of, of work in history. One that is rooted in universal human propensities, or perhaps in essential human nature. One that points towards the universalization of human experiences and interests, even while remaining marked by great, vari by great variations and mediated by a myriad of specific historical, geographical, and cultural particularities, as suggested by Dan Trotsky's Lama and McLean. In my own work, I've tried to show that the idea of human social development progress if you like, can be sustained, but not on the one side of theoretical grounds that have been proposed by Marxists committed to what you might call productive forces determinism or technological determinism, or indeed by those who focus no less one-sidedly on class struggle, conceptualized as a conscious struggle between agents rationally pursuing individual or collective interests. To be sure, there are important elements of truth in both of these approaches. But each is one-sided. Each operates to some extent, and often quite unconsciously, within a shared dualism. Neither approach is dialectical. If by dialectical we mean a consistent opposition to an idealist metaphysics that regards ideas, values, subjectivities, consciousness, what have you, as somehow existing independently of the material world both as natural and social dimensions. In other words, neither approach upholds a dialectical and materialist monism. It recognizes that the human condition, and therefore human history, and the human prospect is shaped, shaped by and depends upon the interplay of three distinguishable but also interpenetrated ontological fields. The natural realm conscious activity, and changing ensembles of social production relations. Now, the definitions of all three of these terms are certainly subject to theoretical contestation, an issue that I lack the time to explore here. But my key point is that this triadic ontological structure, foundational to Marx's materialist conception of history, is the necessary starting point for resisting theoretical strategies that reduce the social to a mere effect of either so-called natural laws or the ideal culture. Central to the Marxian theoretical strategy is its insistence on recognizing the irreducibility of the social relations of production and reproduction to either pole of this dualistic ontology as well as its focus on the relatively autonomous and often decisive role of these relations, these social relations of production and reproduction, in constituting and animating ever-changing human
tradition. One that is, in the course of history, uh, and particularly in the capitalist era, has taken on an increasingly universal dimension. The social plays a determining and mediating role in Marx's triadic ontology, even as it also engenders real contradictions that propel change. And one hopes progress, defined as an improvement in human well-being and the flourishing of human capacities, both individually and collectively. <coughs> When grasped by the conscious human beings, however imperfectly, the maturation of these contradictions can create the ground for social revolution, the overturning of a determined social formation, or mode of production, or articulation of modes of production, and the inauguration of a new more progressive ethic than what Marx calls the economic formation This points towards a key argument that I've long made against postmodernist theories. And I have ventured into that in the past. I did it in my first major uh, book, Invisible Life, which is subtitled of the Marxist critique of postmodern, of uh, Marxist critique of market despotism, excuse me, beyond postmodernism. Uh, the key argument I made was that their general omission or underestimation of the determinant role of historically specific social relations of production and reproduction in both advancing and retarding human social development. The consequence of, a, of such a move on the part of post all theory in general is to sustain this, a dualistic ontology that allows for a never-ending oscillation of analytical interests between the material, natural, for example, technology on the one side and the ideal culture, for example, spiritual values on the other. So how does all this relate to the debate over post colonial theory? One of uh, Vivek's most important arguments is his defense of the proposition, regardless of the cultural differences dividing and distinguishing them, working class people or working people or laboring groups everywhere share common universal interests. In this connection, he emphasizes it makes a convincing case for a universal interest in physical well-being. Now, I have no quarrel with this. All the same, it does seem to me an inadequate response to the post <coughs> argument that the pursuit of so mundane as interest is always necessarily cultural media. Marx is by no means blind to the importance of cultural mediation. And to say that Marx in theory cannot accommodate the diverse cultural phenomenology of everyday life is really an outrageous red herring. My main point, however, is that the post-colonialist indictment needs to be turned against the stakes need to be dramatically raised when Marxists respond to the post-colonialist challenge to the idea of universal working class interests. My, my argument is that it is precisely post-colonial theory that too often misses a key mediation in the dialectics of social development, namely the decisively important mediating and indeed dominating role of the social relations of capitalism and its derivatives the law of value, the law of capital accumulation, and the law of falling profitability. The actuality of these laws point to an intensifying contradiction between capitalist imperatives, above all the production and accumulation surplus of value, and the productive forces. Not to mention, of course, what Marx calls the natural conditions of production. Global capitalism is therefore manifestly incapable of providing a framework within which the specters of world war, ecological devastation, and worsening economic malaise can be exercised. Post-colonial theorists, my question to you is, do you deny this? If not, what are you saying about it? More importantly, what are you doing about it? These considerations would suggest the need for an understanding of the logic of capital that actually goes well beyond what, what uh, Vivid has provided, point unmistakably towards a universal interest in the subaltern, the wretched of the earth, referred to in the socialist anthem, the international, and achieving a global socialist civilization capable of securing the conditions of human survival and real human development. I'll leave it there. Um, I'll try to answer these, uh, the points that were brought up. There were so many. Um, 
But I think the way to address this is really by stepping back for a second. I, I, I expected a different kind of conversation. I expected a conversation amongst people who share certain views and I didn't, I didn't realize what I was walking into. There's a real history, a history of the left and a history of social, of social theory, which has been forgotten in large measure because of the work of academics over the past 30 years. If you listen to Janet, you would get the idea that until 1980 or 85, until Gayatri Spivak strode into Colombia, or Homi Baba wrote his book, Marxists have been wagging their fingers at dark-skinned people, telling them, <coughs> think like us, think like the white man. Women don't matter, racism doesn't exist. If you wait long enough, you'll all become capitalists. And the real history is this. In India, where I grew up and where I was born, for 50 years, peasants, indigenous groups, workers, wage struggles through their culture, Murray, wage struggles around their interests against racism, inspired by Marxist ideas. Feminism was brought to India by socialists, not by post-colonialists. Feminists in India for 40 years, since the 1960s when modern feminism was born, worked themselves through socialism and Marxism, engaging the world, not for a second thinking that whatever socialism and Marxism they had been taught was in some way ignoring their plight. Indigenous struggles for the, from, 19, from 1880 to 1960 in India were led always and everywhere by Marxists. They just didn't call it indigenous because they don't like to exoticize. Those were struggles, yeah, expressed in a different cosmology, sure. But you know what? Half your cousins here express things in a different cosmology. It doesn't mean shit. There were struggles for water, for land, for basic control of resources. There's nothing exotic about that. It demeans and insults them to say, these people don't think like us. Don't for a second think that it's somehow prizing them to think of them as the other. It is a defeat of the left. It is the defeat of democratic ideas that has allowed intellectuals first to present this internal academic fashion as if it's the first time that these struggles, these forms of oppression, and these forms of resistance have been recognized. Because it's an outright lie. The reason I wrote this book was partly because many of you in this room are young. Many of you are not going to go into academia, thank God. But you are influenced by the classes that you take and the systematic falsification of history that's being carried out in those classes. You should understand that for the last 30 years, for a brief moment after these, the generation of 68 and the new left flirted with socialism, they've been trying to kill it ever since then. Because they're embarrassed by it and because they never understood it. The real history of the 20th century is the movement and the fight for all of those forms of oppressions by socialists, by Marxists, that now post-colonialist theory, theorists claim they never ever paid attention to. And that's not just for workers' rights. It's also against race. Who was organizing black sharecroppers in the United States in the 1930s? It was socialists and Marxists. Who was fighting for the rights of the indigenous in Latin America, in Bolivia, in Guatemala, in India? in the 1960s and 70s. It was socialist groups, it was Marxist-inspired guerrilla groups. They just didn't call it that. Even as late as the 90s, who was fighting for LGBT rights in Canada and the United States? In South Africa, who led the fight to recognize the reality of AIDS? It was socialists. It takes genuine courage to lecture to socialists and say, you need to take these things seriously after a century of struggle. Now, many of you are, like I said, are leaving academia. The only reason I'm bringing this up is, once you leave academia, you won't encounter these ideas again, I hope. But you will have an opportunity to encounter socialist ideas, because they're never going away, no matter how much the academy tries to kill them. I somehow squeaked through. I got a job at a big university. I was able to write this book. It shouldn't have happened, because the project has been to kill them. Now, that said, whatever the criticisms are, honest people have to take them seriously. They may come from a bad place, they may come out of ignorance, but they have to be taken seriously. And I want to just address them a little bit. 
It is quite correct to say that modern capitalism cannot be understood outside of the colonial experience. Guess who pointed that out? It is quite accurate to say that the rise of the West comes out of an entanglement with the non-West. Well, congratulations, you are now in Marx's circa 1920. It is quite accurate to say that colonialism demeaned black and brown people. Well, until the post-colonialists came around, it was only Marxists who were saying this, and I should say, some of the better liberals. The, that same Enlightenment tradition that is now said to be the culprit behind all this sort of stuff. All these things are accurate. My objection is simply, how can post-colonial theory says they are the ones who made these arguments? They simply inherited them from us. There's a difference, though. The only post two points. No, as far as I know, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, not a single work of economic or uh, political history has been done by post-colonial theorists to actually cash out the claim, as Janet wrongly said, that the Industrial Revolution happened every somewhere else. Not true. If a fact is a fact, you've got to accept it. Not a single post-colonial theorist has actually shown that 1492 is what enables the West to grow. The, they all get their facts from one source, that's Emmanuel Wallerstein. Now, Wallerstein might be right, it's true. But, you should know, there is a huge debate around his work, and there are legitimate criticisms of it, which you would never know if you read Annabel Quijano, because Quijano pounds his fist on the table and says, this is gospel. What post-colonial theory has done is taken empirical propositions and turned them into dogma. And if you disagree with them, you're racist. This is how it goes. So the strategy goes like this. You make these strong arguments about how brown people don't think like us, they have different cosmologies, they don't think in linear time, they think in loop-de-loops, that the West can only get rich because of the, make these arguments, and then you say, look, Marxists don't recognize it. Then when Marxists comes and says, actually, we've been saying this for a long time, then you make the weaker one, which is, well, all I was saying is there's entanglements. All I was saying is this interaction. All I'm saying is that you shouldn't be methodologically nationalist. Well, if that's all you were saying, nobody would have noticed you. Because socialists and Marxists have been saying this for 100 years. Now, don't take my word for it. All I'm saying is, once you get out of here, which is, I hope, soon, and you're not in an academic graduate program where your career now depends on actually propagating these falsehoods, sit down and read. What you will see is none of this is true. It's all part of the moral and intellectual shifts that have come since the 1980s. And the good thing is, after a long, very long, the longest of my knowledge hiatus in real social movements in the West and elsewhere, it's been about 40 years now, they're getting going again. And some of you will have the moral and political fortitude to sit down and read. And when you do, and when you see that the arc of justice in the last 150 years, that arc of justice has been carried forward by the very same people who are denigrated in these talks. Well, what you'll see is maybe I can contribute something to it. Because we're not going away. That's all I have to say. Yes. Uh, so I have uh, six points. <laughs> uh, but they're quick points. <laughs> First of all, it's university policy to acknowledge the territory we're on. So that would have been a better form for the meeting. We're on the shared territories of the Anishabi and Hosodani people, you know, also known as Ojibwe and Iroquois, depending on European terminology. Uh, second, dialectics. Maybe it's come up. The core of dialectics is the negation of the negation. All of you here are being negated. Maybe by what the main lecturer said, maybe what some of the discussants said, or maybe just the general academic atmosphere. So for your own sake, negate that negation. Become conscious. Think seriously about things. Thirdly, to give an example of the negation, and I haven't read your text, but I, I read an interview you gave to the uh, International Socialist Review a couple of years ago. So where you say, an example of the negation is 
modern era. And so I, I was funny that you were surprised you didn't get the comments you expected because you actually said in that you find an absence of Marxist intellectuals both within the labor movement and within the intelligentsia. So I object to that negation. I've been in the labor movement for 47 years. I've been academic on this campus for 25 years. And I may not be dominant, but I'm not someone you can ignore, right? right? So that's, I reject that negation. So the fourth point is, you know, there's a little article, if you study Marxism in this school, you all read it. It's Marx's little article on the Jewish question. Don't get confused, it's not a racist diatribe. This is a rejection of the liberal concept, of the liberal conception of the worldview. And he says, once you get rid of this, which he believes only the working class can achieve by putting forward as its aim the abolition of the wages system. You know what that means? You abolish the wages system, capitalism is gone. Then you begin history, not the end of history, then you begin history, but it's human history. It's the history of the species, not the history of classes, not the history of races, not the history of religion, but the history of humanities, and we have this one common humanity. But let's smash this wages system. Then the fifth point, you know, where do I get these crazy ideas? Well, when I was young and in university, Sir George Williams, I borrowed a book from a uh, a friend at school who happened to be the son of Chevy Jagan Jr., the first Marxist president of Guyana. So I read this Communist Manifesto and it intrigued me. You know. Go ahead. Yeah, well. Not Guyana. Yeah, in South America. Sort of Central America. Sort of. uh, secondly, my professor in the last year, anthropology. Wait, your fifth point has two parts? <laughs> yeah, actually, three parts. So, so, so uh, the, the, uh, he required me to read a few things and one of it was The Origin of the Family, Private Property and Estate. It's a book written by Engels. There's a chapter in there where he cites the work of Morgan. You know, Morgan codified and wrote down and did a study, not as an anthropologist, but somebody who fought with the Iroquois for their land rights against the corrupt American state. But he wrote a whole book on what the Iroquois gen system is, and that helped Engels and Marx understand the origin of family, private property of the state, the things that engendered you know, markets and capitalism in the first place. And the third thing uh, was that we founded our party in 1970, so since then I've been schooled by my own creation, the Marxist-Leninist party. So the final, the final remark, the final remark, the sixth Yes, please. Three quick questions. Okay, A, is East versus West still two categories that make sense, or is it um, more than that, like North, South, there's B. Um, is Marxism just a materialist ideology, or can it be understood as siding with the oppressed always and everywhere? Um, the last one is, would bringing Marxism to Africa, or any other uh, not first world country, which I think was, I think the first, it was, yeah, it was uh, Guinea, or Guinea, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, and it was also in Senegal, I think. Um, would bringing Marxism to, for example, Africa be um, perpetrating cultural hegemony of Europeans? Because Marxism is a European. I ask everyone. Africa. All the anti colonial struggles were either under the leadership of socialists or had a substantial socialist component to them. I honestly don't know where the question comes from to say, because essentially what you're saying is those Africans who were socialists weren't Africa. No. No, I'm not saying that. Look, man, you've just been taught this stuff by your professors. I don't blame you at all. No. So. Then, then, what, then where does it come from? Because it's elemental. All these struggles were led by socialists. So wh how, why pose the question as a future question of what will happen if we bring Marxism to it? It's been there since the 1930s. I was just wondering what the definition of East and West is. OK, so that's, that was your first question. Yeah. East and West is just, it, they're code words for saying poor versus okay. uh, rich countries. Because they use Latin America. Latin America also is the East in all of these debates, which makes no sense. 
So what they really mean is north-south. It's also okay. called east-west. Um, the middle question about uh, is it just a materialist ideology or does it just stand for opposing oppression everywhere? It, it, it's actually, uh, Marxism is a, it's a social theory. So the ideology is socialist. So if an ideology gives you your values, gives you your goals. Marxists are socialists who happen to abide by a certain theory of how society works. Marxism, that's either right or wrong. So Marxism, your attitude towards it, if you're on the left, should be, look, it's either right or wrong. And just like a, you know, a scientist's attitude towards any particular theory within physics, right? So that is, that's not the ideology of uh, socialism. Now, you had a subcomponent, which is, is it just a body uh, of a belief system that says you should oppose oppression everywhere? The answer is yes. So the Marxists believe wherever you have oppression, it's wrong. And they, and that's why it's important. It's not oppression of white people or oppression of brown. What makes Marxism uh, you know, interesting is that it says oppressive practices can be identified everywhere, and they're not always internally recognized. That is to say, it's not that Indians will have a different conception of oppression. There'll be some differences around the edges. But Indians don't like being bossed around any more than white people. Nigerians don't like being bossed around. Now, there might be some blurriness about what constitutes being bossy. But at every definition has blurriness around the edges. So the values tell you yeah, oppression is wrong everywhere. What Marxism gives you, though, is the theory of where that oppression comes from. And on that, there's going to be you know, empirical disputes. But the, uh, the commitment is to all and in all oppression. So not just capitalist or white men or something, but all of them. And that's why Marxism has been in every social struggle against oppression, regardless of what you're told in your classroom. Uh, just, can I, I How about we'll, we'll give each of you a, a moment, a minute. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, I take my minute, I go straight ahead. I think some of these controversies could, you know, could uh, be dissolved if we stop using uh, socialism as being contaminous with Marxism. There are other variants, you know, variants of socialist uh, idea like Mao's idea and stuff like that. They are not exactly uh, the same, but they are quite similar. Like Mao will lay the emphasis on, on the peasants as against the proletariats. And I, I, I believe that, like, uh, when uh, Dr. Tibel was responding, he tended to be using uh, socialism as uh, being contaminous with Marxism. I will agree with most of his response if he drops the social, if he uses the socialism word. But if he talks about Marxism, then I will kind of disagree with that because I don't, I don't believe that they are the same. Yeah, I, I, I agree. With you. Yeah, I totally agree. That's what was implicit in my saying: socialism is a value, Marxism is a theory, and there's lots of non-Marxist socialists. Yeah, well, I was going to add that, of course, even amongst Marxists, there are a lot of differences. And Marxist socialism is not, by any means, homogeneous. And, you know, you know, some of this, I, I have to admit, I'm inclined towards this as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, if you like, doctrinaire in, in terms of being proper. I'm towards the term Marxist. I really think that it is not that uh, ecumenically applicable. To a lot of people, just because you call yourself a Marxist doesn't necessarily mean you are a Marxist. Okay, uh, and some people are more generous about that than I. Am. Uh, but I got a real problem with somebody who tells me Joseph Stalin was a Marxist <coughs> beyond a certain point. I think he was a Marxist, but I think uh, you know when he became the leader of a, of a political counter revolution, essentially in the USSR, and wiped out most of the leadership of the Bolshevik Party, most of his own comrades, as well as hundreds of thousands of other communists workers, sent them off to the, the, the death camp, you know, the labor camps and so on in Siberia. I don't think at that point you could call them a Marxist. You certainly couldn't call them the kind of Marxist that actually fights oppression everywhere, right? <laughs> because he himself was the fount of a lot of, of oppression and oppression. Uh, so, you know, I, I agree with the other comments. Yes, that's right. Janet, do you want to? Uh, well, I'll just take a moment to say, um, that, uh, I mean, Vivek uh, began his response by saying he wasn't prepared for the kind of discussion that this was. Well, I'm set in that. Uh, to say that, um, to me, this was, I did not come in here to have a discussion about Marxism. I came in here to have a discussion in response to your book about post-colonialism. So everything that I said was actually about post-colonialism. It was not about Marxism. And part of the problem, it seems to me, 
is uh, drawing such a strong line between, like you're making these two completely mutually exclusive camps, which I don't believe they are. There's a lot of post-colonialism that's directly informed by and fed by histories of Marxist politics and theory. But it also um, expands beyond that. It's not contained by that. And I guess you know the discussion here in this group, this is a Brock Socialist Club, maybe that preoccupation here is about Marxism. Uh, my remarks should not be taken to be about Marxism. They're about post-colonialism. So I just wanted to add that little clarification. Thanks, Janet. So we'll take three questions. We'll try to keep them uh, concise. For Shannon, then I just have a comment. Um, usually when something like weird happens or aggressive happens, like I always go back home and I'm just like, oh, that was really messed up. I wish I said something and I say something. And it's just some stuff like I just find really ironic. Like uh, when some things are being said, like just open your mind to Marxism, you need to read more. Uh, these people aren't being open minded enough. But then at the same time, you're calling people ignorant, condescending them, and then uh, you're saying, oh, you're just taught like that. Like there's there's no rebuttal to any of the, the points that are made. Like a, a lot of what uh, if Annie's questions and Janice's questions, which I thought were like, oh, I wonder what she was gonna say, and then you're like, well, I, I didn't expect to be locked down on this, and then you just go on and just call it ignorant. Like there's some I questions. I responded to virtually all of them. Um, so the arguments. No, I, I this is. I want to let you understand. Fine. No, I just, so the, I, the, the there's a claim that it. marks because there's a whole laundry list. I was given five minutes to respond to about 17 points. So I had to amalgamate them. The, I had to categorize them into broad groups. One broad group was that post-colonial theory looks at entanglements, the role of the colonial world in the development of modernity, in the development of capitalism, the possibility that the industrial revolution happened elsewhere, which Marx is more. I put those in a group and I said, all of those are legitimate issues, legitimate questions. All of them were raised by Marxists for the past 40 years. Now, naturally, I can't give responses other than to say they're highly controversial. But the, the criticism was Marxists need to look at this. I did not say that. That's not what well, I said. Well, luckily, it's on camera. I, <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. I was talking about what I thought were legitimate issues that I think are theses put forward by the body of post-colonial scholarship, which happens to be convergent with your version of Marxism. But Janet, the whole point is, if Marxism is already drawing on this, what is it that post-colonial theory... Because there's an awful lot of Marxism that doesn't say an awful lot of that. It says no, an awful lot of post-colonial theory that doesn't. What's the point of that? Defending I'm any just... particular anything. You're the one who's defending a particular orthodoxy. That does segue into my question. Oh, excellent, thank you. <laughs> well, I have, I have a question for Vivek and then a question for Janet, which is a segue. But uh, for Vivek, uh, my question is really on the last part of what you said in your response is kind of asking me a bit of a psychiatrist or a politician. It's, um, you, you talked about the motivation, the general project, project here of um, basically trying to kill the knowledge or history of Marxism. But many of the people who you, um, cited in post-colonial theory are, as you said, from the new left, or they had experience in the new left. Like I think you mentioned uh, Chatterjee and people like that. So given that they've come from this background, I mean, do you think along the lines of the motivation that you said, do you think they're turning back on their experience? I mean, I, I'm a little surprised by if that would be it or where, where this is coming from then, if the proponents of post-colonial theory are people who've been Marxian, Marxist, or want to say, and then uh, for Janet, my question is actually kind of an echo of what Vivek just asked. Um, uh, you mentioned about uh, entanglements. Uh, I saw a YouTube video of a talk you gave where in one of the World Social Forums it was brought up about uh, looking at the crisis as being a world ecological crisis. And in the next social forum, it again was reduced into economy. So I want to ask you then, just ba basically what Vivek asked is, um, what then does this insight of uh, entanglement, it's insight of um, 1492 and so on, what does that add to uh, what Marxist, Marxist analysis then? To grapple with um, is the persistence of colonial difference, what the Latin Americans call colonial difference, or subaltern difference. And that they are trying to find a way, or what the subaltern studies people 
are doing when they're talking about peasant insurgency in India. They're, they're trying to think about these different life worlds that persist. And, um, and they persist and they have their own logics and they're not disappearing. They were thought, it was thought they would disappear and they're not disappearing. And that there's a grappling with what that means. And I think that the tendency in a lot of um, modernist scholarship, of which, in which I would include Marxist scholarship, is to not either not see those other life worlds or not consider them important. And I see that also in Vivek's book. And I think that's, to me, one of the most important contributions of some strands of post-colonial thought. Now, there's lots more to say, but that's just one contribution. But if I could just ask, didn't, didn't the poet of Marx's own writings talk about peasant revolts and the, the importance No, I'm talking about different life worlds. I'm talking about different cosmologies, different ontologies. There's a whole thing you wrote about <laughs> India and about. Yeah, I think it's in a different register. It's grappling in a different register. It's, and oh, sorry. That's Wait. my, you know, so I, I see some things that, I, like, yeah, I mean, if, if you're um, committed to Marxism <coughs> and it's working for you, I'm not telling you to abandon it. What am I missing out on, though? I, I don't want to miss out. I want to get what you have. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, that's a long conversation. Because <laughs> I think there are, I mean, there are many, mul there are multiple strands of critical theory that are arising from different social subjects in different parts of the world that uh, are in shouting distance of Marxism, as Stuart Hall said all those years ago, and in some ways came out of, or have some roots in Marxism, but not only in Marxism, but in, in a variety of ways have found that there are other things they need to think about and talk about, and that Marxism does not allow them to do it in the ways that they feel that need to, it needs to be done. So these are open-ended, plural projects. Many versions of feminism, many versions of critical race theory, queer theory, many versions of post-colonial thought. I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot written about, so I mean, I, I understand the frustration with certain ways of um, um, characterizing Marxism in two simple ways and, and dismissing it too simply, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, there are, you got to ask yourself why so many uh, strands of critical theory have felt the need to actually critique Marxism and try to think outside of it. There are reasons for that. And it's not to dismiss the, important, the historical importance of Marxism, in my opinion. Thanks. Janet, I'm looking at the clock, yeah. and, I, and I need to give Vivek his time because we, and I mean, as I can say as moderator, of course, I've done a terrible job. But part of the reason is is that we believe in these things passionately, and, and there's so much we want to say, and I think we were probably given an impossible task. Um, we and we've four, you know, brilliant orators in, in many ways, in your own, uh, you know unique styles, and I think we could probably, if we had the, the, the patience and if we weren't told that we should stand every once in a while, maybe we could stay another hour. I just would be the summation. I, I don't, I think I've said enough about yeah, the general comments. You, you addressed a specific question to which I, I guess I should answer, which is why, um, how does one explain people like Jagger, you know, when people turn away? Well, is that what you're saying? That the, that the people who want to kill Marxism are the people who keep them in your book? I mean, there's a long story behind that, uh, which uh, would probably take me 10 minutes to, to, to give, and it's not a charitable one. Um, but I think the characterization that they came out of the New Left and trying to kill it is absolutely, of course, true. Um, it, it has to do with, um, one can't focus on individual psychology because one doesn't know what individual motivations are. One can talk about the, the general trend. Generally speaking, um, intellectuals are never going to be uh, friendly to Marxism. That's because they're middle class people in jobs where it doesn't pay to be a Marxist. And this is just as simple. And if you look at the history of modern thought, Marxists never were in university until the 1970s. And they never will be. And the reason is the people who teach courses on social theory have an instinctive hostility towards, suspiciousness of, uh, and uh, uh, kind of um, 
uh, lack of charity towards Marxism. The, the general rule of thumb in academia is normal protocols of scholarly uh, thoroughness and fairness go out the window when you talk about Marx or any of the following things. And that's just, uh, that's how it's been for a long time. The reason is simply that the people in these positions don't have any reason to be hostile to capitalism. They're doing quite well. The 70s were a very unusual time where two things happened. The, for the first time in the 20th century, an entire generation of students was radicalized because of the confluence of feminism, the civil rights movement, and the labor upsurge, and anti-imperialism. And at that same time, normally they would have been kicked out into the streets where they belonged, and they would have gotten jobs doing this, that, or the other, and joined some parties, and remained committed to a kind of newfound socialism or Marxism. And here I'm using them interchangeably for consciousness. What happened instead was the number of universities in North America doubled. And all these people got jobs. They got jobs right when the labor movement died. And their personal, professional biographies became ones of upward advancement. And two things happened. Their personal circumstances changed so that there was nothing pulling them out of the university towards movements because the movements were dead or dying. What they were being pulled into was professional circuits of advance, advancement in which the American genius of anti-communism still ruled supreme. And they, very, they learned very early on that if you're going to make it, Marxism isn't going to be part of the package. But because they've been radicalized by the 60s, they still saw themselves as radicals. So you had this basic problem. You wanted to be, you think of yourself as a radical. You couldn't be a Marxist. Something had to go. What happens was, Janet, what Janet is saying, the Stuart Halls, the New Gramscians, the socialist feminists who were no longer the socialist part, all the hyphens got broken. What remained is what was left after it, that's after the hyphen. And now, radical thought had to be refashioned so as to push class and capitalism out of it. Part of this formation was dark skinned people. People inhabiting African studies, South Asian studies, Middle Eastern studies. And they actually had a special advantage, which is in area studies, thanks to post-structuralism, thanks to standpoint theory, etc., they could claim epistemological privilege. And you have no idea what that does to a student. Until you've been in a graduate seminar, you do not know what, I mean, I felt this. I'm, I'm in a PhD program, they're talking about India, and suddenly all eyes turn to me. And I realize nothing I can say will be wrong, simply by virtue of my skin. I mean, it takes an extraordinary amount of discipline to uh, not fall prey to this. And they didn't. And now, the enticement to click. Janet mentioned feminism. You know who brought post-structuralism and feminism together? It was Dr. Spivak. The first essay she wrote, you know what it was? Was that in 85 uh, or 82? It was in around 77, she wrote a review of Julia Kristeva's work. And what did she say to Kristeva? Christiva is a French woman writing about the French onslaught in Vietnam and the plight of Vietnamese women. And Spivak, first time, people don't know this, first time, is, to my knowledge, in the history of the left, where somebody who calls himself a socialist said to another socialist, you don't get to talk about this. Why? Because you're white. That is what slowly gained steam over the 80s and 90s. And today, this is why when you walk into a seminar on something on India, it's been said the Indians are, you can look at them or they stand out. And the, what we call in India, we used to jokingly call the syndrome of the native informant. So what happens in the 80s and 90s is because of the self-positioning of these erstwhile brands, from below, what happens is all these new programs start up, and for the first time, women, people of color, minorities, they're coming into universities where they were excluded before. And they are a kind of a mass base for a non-class base, non-anti-capitalist radicalism. And that becomes then the, as it were, the mass base for these theories. And listen, it's not gonna go away. It's never gonna go away. There will never be a place for Marxism in the academy. And my view is, thank God, it doesn't belong there. Well, just <laughs>